Dr. Michael Neal, thanks so much for coming on the Grow Ortho podcast today. Thank you so much for having me, Luke. Absolutely. For those listening and watching, give just a brief introduction of yourself and what you do. I'm a practicing eye doctor. So what's an eye doctor doing on an ortho uh, podcast? Well, I built a system, uh, an automated system to hire people without using resumes for your practice and my practice too. Um, it's all based upon strengths and talents. And we've been doing this throughout uh, the US and uh, Canada now in over 40 states with nine different healthcare professions. We've been able to crack the code on how to get terrific A player team members into your dental and ortho practices. How'd you get into medicine, private practice? How, how did that come to be? Well, started off. Let me see, private practice. Uh, my wife started the practice originally back in, what was it, uh, 2002, I guess. And I joined in 2000 and not, uh, 2008. Um, our practice uh, burnt down. We lost mm. everything, everything but a stapler, if you can believe that. Whoa. <laughs> a stapler. It's like the office space. Oh, God. Yeah, um, it crazy. was crazy. That was a... It was a nightmare. It was a multi-year nightmare. Mm. And so I, I joined then, um, took over the practice, you know, got it back up and running, um, took over the management of the practice and, and growing it. The one consistent problem that we always had was HR. And, you know, that's kind of a global mm -hmm. catch-all phrase nowadays. The real issue was getting the right team members on board. And uh, we were hiring wrong. So we were hiring wrong for years until um, I essentially joined a, well, for lack of a better term, an entrepreneurial leadership group. And what I noticed in that group is that they had a, a large team of very nice, wonderful, serving type people. And they did a terrific job. Kind of light bulb went on. And for me, the light bulb was, well, these guys can do it. Why can't we? Like, what are we doing wrong? Consistently banging our heads against the walls, getting team members that leave uh, that aren't performing properly, that aren't just flat out not high performers, not even medium performers, most of them. So we were doing something wrong. We just didn't know what right looked like until then. And that's uh, that was kind of the the start of maybe there's a better way. And then I dove in from there. And I've dealt with this in my own business. You start to believe, I think, that people are only on this level, you know, and you make yeah. excuses around that. I remember uh, being at a mastermind as well, and uh, the other agency owners kind of called us out and was like, no, it's you guys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that that yeah. was probably in like 2019. It's hard to hear, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard to hear. But it yeah. it's typically right, you know, it... And, and we're still talking to people who have hiring issues and, you know, people come and I can't keep them. And I do understand that um, since COVID, things have gotten more complicated. However, I don't hear any of the practices with docs with the right mindset and th they're on the up and up. I don't hear any of them complaining about team, finding people. Uh, and so I find that very interesting. What are some of the things practically that you started to experience in the practice or knowing that you had a need for high perform team members? Uh, what were some of the things that y'all were going through that kind of had you guys pulling your hair out? You mean the, the bad stuff? Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Maybe, maybe some of the bad stuff or maybe it wasn't even bad. It was just um, it was bad br break points, <laughs> you know, and, and you couldn't yeah. get past it. I think that the, the main thing that we realized, we had every conceivable problem, right? So first of all, we were hiring to, to try and help people. And we were, we were extrapolating the doctor approach to taking care of people to hiring people. And I'm telling you to your listeners, if you're doing this, it is categorically the biggest mistake I think you can realistically make without realize you know without knowing it we were trying to help people improve themselves get a leg up um get their life together all they need is one break you know i just need you to take a chance on me and we were doing it <laughs> hmm. one after another after another and it was it was disastrous it it was awful the cold hard facts behind hiring 
come along the lines of you want performers. You want mm -hmm. people who can wake up in the morning, go to work, utilize their talents and strengths, don't really think much of anything when they're performing incredibly well and go home and then repeat it the next day. That's what you're looking for. What we got instead is what we were hiring for. That, that was people that um, were not performers. They were always looking for somebody to give them a hand help. We were essentially treating our interviews along the lines of how we would treat patients. And it was disastrous. We did that for several years, not really figuring that, uh, well, you know, it was learned helplessness in a lot of ways. No matter what we did, we got the same results until I was shown that um, there were, not only was a better way to do it, but it was systematized and it was predictable. And you could get these results over and over again by following, a, you know, a system essentially. And that's yeah. what that that particular uh, uh, group showed me. And then I turned around and created a system, which uh, was their system better and improved upon with um, with all kinds of stuff. And just to get a state of the practice before implementing this system, I'm sure you guys were not necessarily hitting your goals or you were getting stuck or maybe it was one step forward two steps back what what was that like in the practice oh we were hitting things all right <laughs> <laughs> walls with foreheads you know face palming uh you name yeah. it all kinds of stuff why did this continue to happen i mean i just i go back to thinking about those days and it, it was a it was a merry-go-round. It was a revolving door. It was the mouse on the exercise wheel. It doesn't matter what you know way you're going to describe it. We never really got anywhere until mm -hmm. we made the changes. And what we did in our practice is we rated everybody when we started this process. Everybody got rated on a traffic light. So green, yellow, red. The reds were replaced first, um, then yellows, and uh, we kept two people out of 14 people. We moved from 14 full-time people to 10. We cut mm. four positions. Our practice went up 50% in gross revenue. Wow. With four, four less people. And our net income more than doubled. Stop and think about that for a second. That's crazy. The average net in ortho is between 30 to 40%. So that's a dangerous spot to be in mm -hmm. because... At one and a half million, you're making enough to have a very comfortable living almost everywhere. If you want to grow from one and a half million to, let's say, three million, you have to change what you're doing. Who the hell wants to change when they're making, they can be making eight, nine hundred thousand bucks a year. They don't have to change anything. They just have to mm -hmm. continuously show up for work and uh, slog through the day, right? Exactly. And that's where, you know, we, we were at a level where... Um, I understand that. However, when they do make the change in in mindset and get rid of the team members and replace them with these A players, you're not doing one and a half million bucks anymore. And you're not a 30% net. You might be 40, 45. I mean, our practice is in the top 1%, we're in the top 10% of 1% in America in terms of net income uh, per our gross. And we got there because of the team. It is not because of the the genius on the other end of the this, this Zoom or you know, podcast. I'm not that guy. It's the team that delivers these results. I'm, I'm preaching the converted a little bit, but you know, when when the front desk person in your book has the opportunity to book another family to come in that day, or not book another family to come in that day, what's an A player do versus what's a C player do? Mm -hmm. You know, and all that money goes straight to the bottom line because there, it's just it's that's the variable. Um, right to the bottom line. So the, the biggest change I think out of everything was the, a switch flipped in my head, knowing that it could be done differently, that there was a way out and that we could hire people for their natural talents and strengths so that they would utilize what they're naturally good at instead of, you know, you got to contrast this to something, right? So you contrast it to, they have a great personality, big smile. They show up for work. You know, whatever you decide to uh, to look for in an interview, that's what you bring in on those team members. The real, you know, one of the massive learning experiences from this is that as a doctor, 
interviewing team members, especially younger team members, it's just a colossal waste of time. It doesn't do much at all other than have them tell you what you want to hear with a big smile on their face or nervous as heck or deer in the headlights or all those types of things. Being a doc flat out intimidates most people in an interview. Mm -hmm. The fundamental issue is that the format itself is, is flawed. An interview between a very senior person and a very gen- junior person is always going to yield anxiousness, you know, uh, all, just all kinds of things like that. And especially in the younger generation, they they struggle with anxiety and, and all those types of things. Um, so it just doesn't work. The turning point for us was that um, we were able to create an assessment process that used um, psychometric assessments to determine what a person was good at. And if you have no idea what any of this stuff is, it sounds like witchcraft and all that. Well, the fact of the matter, it isn't. Um, There's ways to accurately predict what a person is outstanding at, good at, all those types of things. We can predict their stress uh, tolerance level. We can predict how they deal with uh, systems and processes, following details and procedures, all of those types of things. So what ended up happening is um, it took a couple of years and a lot of kicks at the can before we were able to get uh, build a process that looks for all of those types of things in a potential team member. And then we started using email to contact those team members. And guess how well that worked? Not well. <laughs> it was a disaster. <laughs> um, for anybody listening, if you're using email to contact potential you know, candidates for your healthcare practice, I got to tell you, stop. It doesn't work. Whatever results you're getting, you will you will 10x them by texting these people. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe more. I mean, in our particular case, it wasn't 10x. It was a lot more than that. Email was completely dysfunctional. What ends up happening is you ask the folks, do you have email? Yes. The answer is always yes. Now, ask them level one follow-up. Do you check your email? What's the answer? <laughs> Sometimes. Well, the answer maybe. for most of them in an interview is yes. Second level follow-up. How often? Well, once to twice a week. That was the answer we tended to get. And once to twice a week, that's that's complete garbage. It was once a week, if that. Usually seven to 10 days is what we found out. So a seven to 10 day response cycle during the hiring process will get you exactly nowhere. Now, you flip it around and you look at how fast they respond to their text messages. And it's you know almost uh, instantaneously. Mm-hmm. So what we ended up doing is um, we built an entire system to email these candidates and we had to scrap it. We had to stop. Uh, pause and built an entire texting system to uh, to reach out to these candidates because email flat out was uh, what is a disaster. Now, can you use email for corporate hiring for hiring doctors? Of course, you can. There, that's at a different level. But on the team member, you know, potential team member side of things for a practice, it just doesn't work. So that's when we moved to the to a texting model. And your test specifically, I mean, there's things like DISC. Um, Myers Briggs predictive mm-hmm. index we use. Yep. Um, how how is your test maybe similar and also different? Disc and Myers Briggs um, more personality testing. They're not going. They're not only not going to give you the results that you're looking for, but they can be misleading because mm. they're taking you down a path that is almost a false start in terms of, of what you're looking for. And what I mean by that is, we, you know, we we approached it completely differently. So we approached it with an end result in mind. Each of the positions in a healthcare practice is different. So we have different end results for each different position. For example, um, how many billers do you know that are warm, bubbly, and friendly, and you would uh, super stress tolerant, and you would love to put them at your front desk? Very few. Bingo. Right. (laughs) So if you have the same type of uh, algorithm that you're, I'll use that term, that you're looking for a biller, that's identical to what you're looking for in a front desk or a dental assistant or anything like that, you're going to be, you're you're barking up the wrong, wrong tree. We can all agree on that. What we ended up doing was creating uh, position specific um, algorithms to exactly who we're looking for. And this took a while and it took a lot of uh, trial and error and feedback. The main thing is feedback. So this was rolled out to our practice, then our friends practices, and then, um, now we're in almost 40 states in, in the U.S. and can, plus Canada, mm. uh, nine different healthcare professions. So we've got this 
these algorithms down for what makes a terrific person in each of the specific positions. And of course, there's some variability. Oh, we'll pick on front desk because it's universal. So a high volume practice, you're going to need somebody who is terrific with high transactional capabilities. Um, they're terrific with, um, you know, potentially working with team members because it can't just be them at the front desk and stress tolerance. Let's not forget that. Um, I started, you're, not, you're never going to believe this, but believe it or not, before I got into uh, eye doctor, uh, healthcare and as an eye doctor, I was a secretary. I was hmm. terrible. This was back <laughs> in the days of alphabetizing and filing stuff. Uh, it was ridiculous. And my strengths and talents, thank God, were not for that position. It is a position that is extremely hard within a practice to fill. Now, flip that around to a low volume practice, more concierge, um, warm, friendly, huggy, you know, you know what I mean? That type of practice. You're looking for a completely different type of, of person at the front desk. And so it all depends on what type of practice that the that we're, we're dealing with. Imagine a symphony, right? You've got all these different individual instruments. And an individual instrument might be a, a particular type of assessment. Um, it's looking for X. And then another instrument's looking for Y. And when you use all of these at once, you end up with noise. You know, you, you're not playing music per se. And so what we ended up doing is testing different types of assessments. We brought some in. We got rid of most of them. We had to create some from scratch, which was a heck of a uh, chore. But now we're at the point where the first thing that we we do in these assessments is we're looking for people with what we call a healthcare mindset. And the, the healthcare mindset is... Um, you know, do they like to help people? Do they like to serve others? Um, do they have initiative? Can they, um, are they reliable? Do they have honesty and integrity? There's a whole bunch of subcomponents to that. Because let's just say, for example, you don't have a healthcare mindset. How long do you think you're going to possibly last in a practice? Dentistry, ortho, uh, super hard. Um, mm. How long are you going to last if you don't actually like helping people, right? So, you know, we're, we're both nodding our heads here uh, for the audio listeners, <laughs> of course. But um, without that in mind, these folks are going nowhere. And they're going to completely waste your time going through interview process and that type of thing. For orthodontists and dentists watching, listening, and and they're wondering, okay, I get it. You know, I'm, I'm struggling um, with my team, yeah. with leadership. To be honest, too, there's a lot of uh, practices out there who don't really know they're struggling. Mm -hmm. The the team kind of holds the keys to the kingdom and the doctor, uh, we find in many cases, kind of has to go along with what the team is saying, which also keeps things very flat. The way you describe that practice, the tail's wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. That's very concerning. And I've been there. Been there, done that, got the, the proverbial t-shirt. To, to work with us in a practical level, the first thing that... Uh, a client gets from us is the concept of talent cert certainty. Okay. It, what I mean by that is you start working with build my team uh, or the company we started for this. And now any position in your practice um, that you're looking to hire for that's unlicensed, we don't work with licensed positions. Generally, there are some rare exceptions to that, but unlicensed positions, we will be able to fill the position within a reasonable of time, reasonable period of time with somebody who is uh, terrific at their job, A or B player. We do that through using these assessments. So I told you about the mindset assessment. We measure their speed of learning so that you have people who are essentially terrific at learning very, very quickly. We're measuring performance factors. I alluded to a couple of those, how they work with each other, uh, how they're motivated. Um, then we're also measuring a bunch of things like how far away are they from their pra from the practice? These are nuts and bolts logistical things because if they're 20 miles away and they got to pass 10 other ortho practices or dental practices on the way, this probably isn't going to work out long term. Mm -hmm. We're looking to see how long they, they're going to stay at your practice for. We want to know things like can they actually work the, the hours that are, are uh, posted. To back that up a little bit. The way this works in practicality is it starts with a phone call, a very honest phone call with our, one of our team members. And you tell them about your practice. You tell them warts and all. 
I mean, here are the problems we've been having. Here are the things that are going great. Here are the wonderful things about our practices, the challenges, et cetera. Our team members have heard virtually everything. Then what they do is they will write the job, we'll figure out which jobs you're hiring for, write the job descriptions, and then we post it to 22 different job boards. And that is a wild difference between what a practice normally does. The reason it's done that way is that you have to cast the absolute widest possible net. Um, Why? Well, the way our, our model works is we're not looking for the needle in the haystack. What we do instead is we take a stack of needles and we're removing all of the ones that we know can't do the job. Okay, There's only going to be a couple left over. And of those ones that are left over, those we know can do the job. And then uh, they go through our assessment process and that's how we know that they can do the job. And we know that they can not only do it from a strengths and talent standpoint, but they actually have the the ability to show up for work during the hours that you're offering, that type of thing. We also send them uh, a one-way video interview. So we're not only running them through these assessments, but there's a, a real world check where they do a video interview and we're assessing how they respond to the questions. Not necessarily the answers themselves, but there are a massive amount of intangibles that our team members are looking for from those uh, those video interviews. And it doesn't matter what the person looks like if they're like, it, that's irrelevant. We're looking for things like how did they represent themselves? How are they carrying themselves? Are they, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff like that. So once that's all done, our team will send over the finalist candidates to the practice to choose from. And at that point, you can go any, meeny, money, mo, and you're going to get a better outcome than what you're used to by far. Each of the positions um, is guaranteed and they're guaranteed for 90 days. So if a person leaves for 90 days for any reason, you just give us a call back and uh, uh, they're replaced for free. So that's the, the quick summary of what it looks like to, to work with us. Yeah, I see a, a lot of businesses have no filtering process. So they'll put a job up and then it's yeah. like, uh, some people will say, I'm not getting anybody to apply and then we'll log into their Indeed and there's like hundreds of people. Yeah. Um, but regardless, let's say you get a hundred people. How are you going to interview all those people? Yeah. You know, doctors are busy. And so, uh, we've even suggested if they don't ask for a video answering these questions that they, um, enable the voice questions on indeed. And at least Mm -hmm. you can hear the person's tone, tempo, their, um, caliber of response, Uh, you have to do something on the front end because then otherwise, what are you looking at before you waste your time to get on these interviews that you even said are typically not super beneficial? We reject almost 97% of people going through our process. Okay. Now it's, it's shocking. So in terms of a time saver, what you just described to me sounds like a a cataclysmic nightmare having Mm -hmm. to go through those people, because I'll tell you from our experience over 90 at a minimum, 95% are a complete waste. 90% are a complete waste of time and 5% are a moderate, uh, waste of time, mild to moderate waste of time. That's how I describe it from a clinical standpoint. Here's how we solve this problem. When a candidate applies for a position on one of the job boards, remember I said, told you all about that texting system. Well, as soon as they apply within five seconds, their phone bings and they get a text asking them to, uh, you know, thank you for uh, applying for uh, XYZ, you know, dental practice. Um, We'd like you to go through the the assessment process. And it's all worded to get people to do this. And um, it does an incredible job of getting people to take these assessments. Right off the bat, a quarter of them don't. Mm -hmm. Well, some folks have said, well, you know, you're missing out. No, we're not missing out on anything. We just categorically ruled out the extreme time wasters. They're gone. They don't want to lift a finger. They want to get paid to do nothing. So welcome Mm -hmm. to my practice. I'm not going to pay you to do nothing. Get the heck out. (laughs) (laughs) Right? So the ones that go through the assessment process, um, they at each step when they don't make it through, we gently exit them out of the, the process. So if they don't pass the mindset, if their speed of learning is too low, if they, uh, there's a couple other, uh, trigger steps where they would exit our process. Um, when they're done the process, that's when we send them for the, the, or we send the video interview and only a handful get that far. So 
in terms of the practice itself, and this is where I want to be crystal clear, the practice up to this point has done exactly one phone call with our team member uh, to go through uh, the consultation discussion as to what the practice needs. They haven't lifted a finger past that. So there is no time wasting. You can have one of the, the consultation calls in 30 minutes. And then the you get an email um, on a regular basis describing where the process is at. And as soon as we get a candidate, and this has happened, um, the fastest this has ever happened is under 24 hours. Uh, obviously, that's not normal. But as soon as we get a superstar candidate, we send them over to the practice and we tell the practice, you got to jump on this. Okay. Mm. You have to move very, very quickly. This person is terrific. They want to work with your practice. Let's go. And the reason being is that it wasn't very many years ago. Um, I would say easily before COVID, you could take your time on these candidates. You could, uh, you know, you could essentially have a committee hire these people and folks were, were candidates were putting up with that. We'll say now, uh, uh-uh. uh, in our practice, if we have to fill, fill a position, um, we will have a response to the candidate within two to three hours. It's that fast. We do not want to lose any superstar to uh, any other position because we weren't able to decide fast enough. But on the other hand, we know that by the time they get through to that level in our, our process, we know they can do the job. It's just simply who the best fit might be for the, the practice, mm-hmm. uh, for that position. And there's another completely unexpected thing that comes from this. Um, let's say a practice is, uh, uh, let's say they have two positions open. And this happens all the time. In our practice, we have uh, incredibly specific data on this. About 50%, believe it or not, half of the candidates who apply don't get the job they applied for in our practice. We switch them to something else. And the reason being is that they have no clue, like, no clue what their strengths and talents actually are. So mm-hmm. when they apply for for job A and we look at their strengths and talents, we say, well, no, 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 these this person would be terrific at job B. Let's let's shake, you know, move some things around and fill the position at job B. And, you know, sometimes we still continue looking for job A. Sometimes we move somebody internally. We have all kinds of options. But that allows us to get the you know, there's that old um, that old saying, getting the right people on the bus. That's terrific. That's straightforward with Build My Team. Getting the right people in the right seats on the bus, that's where the, the spectacular results start to happen. And mm-hmm. that's what we're able to do as well with Build My Team. Yeah, it sounds extremely rewarding. Not only uh, can you start to take a deep breath and relax a little bit as an owner, but you're... Uh, getting people in the right seats on the bus that you can actually grow and mentor and appreciate that. And I would assume also, you know, keeping this team or these team members is much easier because they're in a role that they enjoy and there's probably a mentorship or growth plan that can be rolled out Mm -hmm. and it makes complete sense based on where they're at and where they could be. The standard model of hiring is is um, round peg, square hole, bigger hammer, where we just take somebody who's not good at the job and and coach them to be better, to be better. But look, I'm flat out telling you, after doing this you know, throughout the, the country thousands of times, it, it doesn't work. You Healthcare positions require a very specific type of person to be successful at it. And you move a little bit like imagine a bell curve you move just a little bit off to the side on each of the on either side and you're going to end up with a massively increasing failure rate it's why people are leaving your practice if you're having troubles with that you might be the best doctor ever you, you probably are and the more empathetic doctor you are the further you should stay away from hiring we're not looking to help people in the sense of what what Amy and I went through early on with our practice we're looking to hire people who can perform. There's something else I, I love to, to say, uh, not my idea, but A players, they, they have to work with other A players. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, A player will tolerate a B player, uh, but they'll leave their job because of a C player. They're out. Now, they know they can get a job somewhere else. There's zero concern from those people. If your practice 
you know, you mentioned early on where, um, you know, the, the doc is kind of concerned about the team members, uh, that, you know, the practice essentially running the doctor over, um, well then you got some problems and how build my team addresses that type of practice is through methodical search to replace the low performers. And would a doc transition low performers out of their practice? Well, the ones that do end up with vastly lower stress, much more free time, and they make more money. Mm -hmm. I've seen that over and over and over again. Now, what do the three have to do with each other? Well, imagine running your practice where you're not taking stuff home at night. You're not stressed out. You're not sweating bullets picking up your phone on, on Monday morning to see who's not in. You don't walk into your office looking for that envelope on your desk where somebody gives you a resignation letter. Been through all that. We don't deal with that stuff anymore. A anytime somebody gives their notice in our practice, which does happen, there is no way to stop that from happening, by the way. Healthcare positions have a, they're not transient, but they have a level of instability to them because people who do these types of positions are generally younger folks they're you know maybe they're not the the breadwinner in the family the spouse moves gets transferred you know there's a million scenarios like that so you will always have people leaving your healthcare practice that's the unfortunate fact the only thing you can do to combat that is look at each time a person leaves as an opportunity to improve the person in the position so you know you call build my team here's what we liked about uh susie or joe and here's what we didn't like. Let's tweak what you guys are looking for this time around to get somebody who's an even better fit for our practice. And that's how we think about things. It is literally that, um, it's not clinical, but it's that methodical in, in what we're looking for. Incredible. So for those who want to find out more, what's the best way to get in touch with you? It's pretty straightforward. Just go to buildmyteam.com. Now, you may think, well, what does an eye doctor have to do with with ortho or uh, or dentistry? I mean, we hire for dentists all the time. We last week we brought on our uh, another ortho client. A private practice is the same thing in ortho, dentistry, eye care, audiology, dermatology, plastics, all the different healthcare um, healthcare practices we have. They're all very very similar. What makes dentistry um, and, and ortho even more special is that we need to really focus on getting um, extremely welcoming people in because there's a massive level of anxiety to go to some of the, you know, to some of these um, visits. And so that's part of our algorithm. Again, that we, we know this. And if you hire these types of people um, properly and methodically, you do get these types of results. So that's where, um, um, you know, we're pretty excited about it, but buildmyteam.com and then simply schedule a consultation, uh, pop it on your calendar because everything's calendared for all of us. And uh, we would be super excited to help. Incredible. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the Grow Ortho podcast. Thank you, Luke. By all means, thank you. If you enjoyed this video, check this one out on how to improve your new patient calls.